Finally, I commend this bill to the House. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, e mihi atu kia koutou katoa. Kia ora. Mr Speaker. Called David Clendon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> uh, nā mahi o te rā kia koutou, e nā manuhiri, uh, e whanganui iwi, nā hapu, nā kaitiangi katoa, o te awa nui a tēnā koutou katoa. <coughs> Sir, before I begin to address the business before us, with your indulgence, I'd just like to put on the record of the House an acknowledgement of the passing of a remarkable New Zealander. <clears throat> Sir Maggie Lawton was a scientist, a businesswoman, a policymaker, later in life a politician, um, a member of the Otago Regional Council, sadly passed away a day or two ago. Um, she was a leader, a leader of a sort who not only sets high standards, but then enables people to meet those standards. She was a proud mother with a reason to be proud, and above all, she'll be remembered for her leadership, for her commitment to the well-being of this country and all of those people in it. Ki te whā mate, moi mai, moi mai, moi mai e roto te ringa o te atua, haere, haere, haere rā. Te honga mate, ki te honga mate, te honga ora, ki te honga ora, Māori ora. Mr Speaker, to turn to much happier matters, and it is with great pleasure it is a privilege to speak on behalf of the Greens in support of this quite remarkable piece of legislation. The Minister referred to it as historic, and it is historic in many ways, not only for at least partly um, um, putting right the harm that has been done to Whanganui Iwi over many years, and indeed to the Awa, but also to the extent to which it does break new ground or um, strengthen our commitment to embedding to old Māori into Pākehā law. And that is a remarkable step. It's a remarkable progress. So in a, one of my former lives, I was fortunate to be a lecturer. I taught in resource management. Um, one of the tasks we set our students quite early in the programme was to challenge them, in a sense, to understand their own world view, the way in which they interpreted and saw and understood the world. And it was thin ice for academics to be challenging young people at that level, at that very fundamental level, about their values and beliefs. But the purpose of it, in part, was to enable them to recognise, to strengthen their awareness that while they had a, a particular world view, uh, a product of their culture, of their upbringing, of their whānau, of all of those things that influence us as human beings, that not only would they have a particular worldview, that the people with which they would engage in terms of their professional career would also have a particular and a unique worldview. And it was endeavouring to help those students understand the importance of respecting and understanding other people and as well as their own positions. So one of the key... Um, challenges we put to our students was to ask them about their understanding of the relationship between humans and the non-human world. And given that many of them came from a Pākehā, predominantly a Western cultural background, um, a very rational, um, dare I say it, worldview, often they would see human beings as separate from the rest of the world, from nature, from this thing we call the environment. And we didn't seek to um, prove those students wrong. But we certainly wanted to challenge them so that they could explicitly state something about those assumptions and those beliefs. And for many of them, there was that sense of dualism, of people being separate from the rest of the natural world. So one of the um, papers, one of the readings I would require of students was an article written in 1972 by an American uh, legal academic called Christopher Stone. And it was called, Should Trees Have Standing? towards legal rights for natural objects. And at the time, it was a rather, um, to say it was controversial would be an understatement. The proposition was that, yes, we routinely assign rights to human beings, but that changes over time. At one time, women had many fewer rights than men, if any indeed. Some women would argue that has not changed dramatically. Um, for many people, the notion of assigning rights to non-human entities was a step too far, and yet they would understand or accept, rather, 
that corporations, that legal, um, that companies, that trusts could have the rights of a natural person. So it ought not to have been, but it turned out to be um, rather difficult, unthinkable was the word he used, for some people to accept a proposition from this Christopher Stone, as I say, an American legal academic in 1972, who said this, and I quote, he said, I am quite seriously proposing that we give legal rights to forests, oceans, rivers, and other so-called natural objects in the environment, indeed to the natural environment as a whole. And in academic circles, legal circles, political circles, that was a bombshell. It was deemed laughable, ridiculous, unworkable. It's interesting, sir, that I think for Indigenous people, not least of all Māori, there is no such barrier to assigning legal rights and agency, personhood, to natural objects, because we as Māori understand we are linked through whakapapa to those elements in the, in the, in the landscape. We are linked through whakapapa to our mountains, to our rivers, to our moana, to our forests. So that barrier that to the understanding or the acceptance of what this bill does has never really existed in the same way. And I think it's remarkable that this bill does embed one of the fundamental beliefs and values of Te Ao Māori, the notion of connectedness with the natural world and human beings as part of it. It embeds that deeply into, into statute, into New Zealand law, in the same way that Te Uruwera legislation did. And I think that's, that's as well as being significant and important as a, um, as a empowerment of Te Ao Māori and Māori beliefs, it's also a very powerful assertion of Tino Ranga Teretanga, the notion that we, Māori, as will others, will determine our own futures and that we should allow the, the elements, the non-human elements of our world, also to have a hand in a say in asserting their own futures, in this case the river. So this, this legislation, I believe, will lead directly, if it is... Uh, assuming a happy outcome in terms of implementation, will lead to a restoration of the Māori of our largest river, and the river that is one of the most significant features in this country and in our cultural world as well. So it's, I would be so bold as to quote um, Gerard Albert, the um, negotiator of Nga Tangata Tiaki o Whanganui, who said that the point is to approximate at law what the river is to us in custom in Kawa, a living tūpuna, not an inanimate, lifeless, resor lifeless resource to be used without regard to its mana. So I think it's um, true to say that any person who sits alongside a river or sits quietly in a forest will hear the voice of that river, will hear the voice of that forest, in a more pragmatic sense, in a more practical sense, the river will require a human voice. And this legislation does allow for that, to po tupua, the human voice of the river, so that when we are making decisions, the, shall I call it, the mundane but critically important decisions about resource allocation, about land use, about policy, that the, voice will have a, the river will have a very powerful voice directly in those negotiations, in those discussion, in that decision making, and it will be Māori voice and a Pākehā voice, and that is as it should be. So I think there is enormous potential in this to not only um, heal the harm that has been done, but also to help New Zealanders who may not yet understand the, um, the significance of Te Tiriti or Waitangi and the importance of embedding Te Tiriti and its articles and its purpose deeply into all of our law, into all of our thinking, into all of our decision making. So the great winner, I believe, in this legislation will be Te Awa Whanganui, it will be the people of Whanganui, it will be all of us. It, en it, uh, it enhances the mana of this parliament to pass legislation of this sort. There are no losers, I believe, in the passing of this legislation. And that's something one cannot always say about bills we put through this House. So, sir, so finally, simply to acknowledge, um, and others are far better qualified than I to name them, so I won't, but to acknowledge those living and those who have passed, who have fought long and hard to bring us to this point where we can 
appropriately recognise the mana of Te Awa Whanganui. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.